Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the special Combined Sunday School. We have fourth graders, uh, all fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. Would you just stand up real fast? Fourth grade, fifth, oh, we have some in the balcony. That's wonderful. Very good. Thank you. Juniors, teenagers, real fast, just real fast. Would you stand up? Now, now, Sister uh, Sue Ann Bostick, why were you standing up when I said the teenagers stand up? <laughs> She's a teenager at heart. Okay, teenagers, we welcome you in here. And adults, if you are a visiting pastor, we have a special session for you, and that's with Brother Marty Heron. Go to the, follow the coffee and the donuts down that hallway there in the gymnasium. And to the left, there are folks who would be glad to take you back there and show you where you are, although you're welcome to be here. We are glad to have with us Brother Rand Hummel, and he has worked at a Christian camp in North Carolina, the wild, since the late 70s, and has been a blessing to many people. We're going to pray and turn it over to him this morning. Lord, we pray that you would quiet our, our hearts. There are a lot of things going on in the world. There's a lot of things going on in our lives. There's a lot of things going on that would, could make us all kinds of distracted from the truth of your word. Lord, I pray that this morning you would help us to see that you speak love. You speak truth. You speak warmth. And may we pattern ourselves after you, our great King Jesus. So Lord, if we're to speak that way, help us to think that way and have open, receptive hearts Bless Brother Rand now as he communicates your truth to us, we ask in your son's name. Amen. Good morning. I don't know if this is true, but I kind of think so. Your pastor told me that of every church he's been in Ohio, that this congregation was the best looking congregation he's ever seen. So since that is true, turn to the person next to you right now, give them a big smile and ask them this question. Don't you wish you looked as good as I do today? Go ahead, ask them. All right. Now, your pastor tricked me. I'm telling you, Aaron tricked me. Because he said, Rand, on Sunday morning, would be okay if maybe like you could speak to our teenagers? I said, oh, I'd love to. My life, probably 85% of my preaching has been to teens. I've had the privilege to be a camp director with the Wilds, 30 years in North Carolina, and now 16 in New Hampshire, and it's been my life. But as I said yesterday, when I get in front of some of you old people, I get a little bit nervous, okay? I do. I just have to remind myself that you older ones are just teenagers with wrinkles, and that I'm okay, all right? But I, there's only one of me, lots of you. Everybody stand up, please. Stand up. I want to get to know you a little bit. Uh, okay, now I want you to sit back down. But only if this is true in your life. And once you sit down, you got to stay down, and we'll see if we can get everybody down. Sit down if you drive and you've gotten a traffic violation in the last six months. <laughs> oh, Emily? Pastor? Somebody told me his middle name is Jehu. I don't know if that's true or not. Okay. All right. Sit down if during your illustrious dating career. Some of you have to think way back on this one. Sit down if during your illustrious dating career you steadily dated at least three different people. Not at the same time, but three different people. <gasps> there they go. And one wife says, I didn't know that about you, huh? All right. Sit down if you sing in the shower. Sit down if you bite your fingernails. Sit down if you bite your toenails. <laughs> Sit down if you have ever tasted dog food. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> Sit down if you are on a diet. Sit down if you're not on a diet, but the person seated next to you should be. <laughs> oh. That guy up there, he just goes, really? All right, this will take care of most of you. Sit down if you are in love. Aww. Sit down if you wish you were in love. <laughs> Sit down if this is your very first time visiting this church. Sit down if this is not your very first time visiting this church. <laughs> Sit down. Okay, very good. 
Oh, it is great. And I, th- I want to thank, in behalf of all of us that got to come in for this pastor's conference, I do want to thank your church just for being so gracious and hospitable. We just had a wonderful, wonderful time. All right, you ready to go home? <laughs> We're going to go home this morning because you know what, a God- you know what makes a godly church? Godly homes. You know what makes godly homes? Godly dads and godly moms and godly kids. Yeah. You want to have a strong church? You got to have strong homes. And to have a strong home, you got to have individuals that are willing to accept their role, their God given role in the home. But we have enemies that attack us very, very quickly. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this verse. And my prayer would be that you would pray David's prayer every day. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Say it with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Lord, please help me today. Help me that everything I say, every word of my mouth, and everything I think, every thought in my heart, Lord, I want you to be pleased. I want you to accept everything I'm thinking and saying. You're my strength. You're my redeemer. Lord, I need you today. So with that in mind, and I'm sure kids and uh, teens, uh, is this true? Nobody likes a tattletale. How many of you just love tattletales? Remember that? Mom! He hit me, Dad, I had him first. And it's amazing how nobody likes a tattletale. But I found out that there's some tattletales in your church, and they're not just teens and kids. Some of them are in their 70s and 80s. Did you know that the Bible is very clear about one thing? Your tongue is a tattletale of your heart. If I want to know what you're really, really like inside, all I have to do is listen to what you say. Because if you have a griping, complaining tongue, you have an incredibly unthankful heart. If you have an angry tongue, you got an angry heart. How do I know this? A good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. And an evil man, now the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And so if you really, really want to know what you're really, really, really like, all you have to do is listen. Now, when we come to church, we're all good, and we put our halos on, and we smile, and we're good. But at home, come on. Some of you men, you're harsh with your wife. You are. And you talk like you don't care. Teens, kids, so you guys fight with your brothers and sisters. It just, I don't care if you call it sibling rivalry or not. God says it's sin. Now, I'm your friend. I am your friend. But some of you have been and will continue, if you don't let God control you, say things that you will regret for years and years and years to come. So with this in mind, there's a couple thoughts. Number one. God is listening. All right. Uh, Teens, kids, uh, understand that when you kind of talk with each other at school or or maybe even at home where you're fighting, all that you need to do is have a teacher walk in or mom or dad walk in. Everybody gets quiet. Why do we forget that God is already there? He hears everything we say. You know the cool thing is? And he still loves us. Isn't that amazing? But he not only hears everything we say. Guys, he hears everything we think and still loves us. That's amazing. I say to you, every idle word the men shall speak, they'll give an account thereof in the day of judgment if it's not dealt with and confessed. There's not a word in my tongue below, Lord, you know it all together. Solomon gives us great wisdom in Ecclesiastes. Be not rash with your mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. God's in heaven, you're upon earth. Therefore, oh, I wish we'd listen to this. Let your words be few. 
You don't have to argue. You don't have to comment on everything. You don't always have to share your heart and share your mind. I'm serious. There are times you need to do this, but there are times to be quiet. So we're going to look at some tongues in the Bible. The first one is the whining tongue. Say it with me. Whining tongue. I did not do very well in school. I'll admit it. But um, I do remember in English class, we had this thing that I don't know how to spell it. It's onomatopoeia. You know what onomatopoeia is? That's the word that sounds like it looks like it sounds like it looks like it sounds like it looks like it sounds. Okay. Whining is one of those words. When I say three, everybody say whining, but do it with a whining voice. One, two, three. You're really good at that, huh? There's another one on this first verse, and it's the word murmur. Say murmur five times real fast. Go. These are onomatopoeias. Jesus answered and said to them, stop it. Stop complaining. Stop murmuring. Stop griping about your health and about your wealth and about nobody likes me and about you don't have anything to do and murmur. Not among yourselves. This is Jesus talking. And then the command in Philippians, do all things without murmurings and disputings. These are commands of God. Numbers tells us when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. Why does it displease God so much when we gripe and complain? I don't care if it's you're an adult and it's about your work or about your kids. I don't care if your kids, if it's about your parents, your school. Why does this displease God so much? I'm going to tell you why. Because whining and complaining is a direct attack on the very character of God. Every time we complain, every time we whine, every time we gripe, hey, God, I guess you're not smart enough to deal with this one. Hey, God, I guess you're not powerful enough to help me through this. It displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. Now, in Numbers 11, you know the situation. This was during the time when the children of Israel were coming through the desert, 40 years. What were they complaining about? In context, it was what they were eating. You ever complain about your food? I don't like that. What were they fed in the morning? What was it called? Manna. What is manna? It means what is it? By the way, if you study manna, really cool, it's cool. And there's two or three places it tells us what it, is, what it tastes like. One place it says it tastes sweet as honey. Another place it tastes like fresh oil. That's a Boston cream donut every morning. And then if that was enough at night, what did God send? What did he send at night to eat? Quail. Think about that. Chicken and biscuits every day. And they still complained. I don't like this. This is what we just had yesterday. Can't we get something else? Every morning they could walk out before the sun came out and they'd see this food, this bread sitting on there. And it was a reminder, just like the cloud above, the manna below was, hey guys, I'm here. This is God speaking. I'll take care of you. I will love you. I will feed you. I will put a cloud over you during the day to keep the sun away, but I'll put a pillar of fire at night to keep you warm and kind of give you a nightlight because it's scary in the desert. And they still complained. Folks, we could be living in Ukraine or Israel right now. And I know there's always a way that you can look at somebody that has it much more difficult. But even aside from that, enter into his gates with what? Griping. Into his courts with what? Complaining. No. When will you guys finally be thankful for what you already have? When will enough be enough? Or let me ask it this way. In what way do you think God has been unfair to you? That's what happens when we start to complain. And all I'm saying is if you have a whining, complaining, griping tongue, you have an incredibly unthankful heart. Number two, and by the way, I know I sound harsh. I'm a teen guy, and teens, you love to be told. You, you don't want to go, somebody go around the barn, okay? So 
I'm going to just treat everybody just like teenagers all day. Number two, a lying tongue. Say it with me. Lying tongue. What does God say? A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. Now, sometimes this verse is misunderstood, but guys, okay, teens, wherever, I know there's some here, maybe some up here. If you cheat in school and lie to a teacher, but if, if we'll take it this way. Mom comes in and says, where were you online? And you lie. Who were you with last night? And you lie. You know what lying actually is? It is loving self so much that it's telling the person that you're lying to. I want you to know that you, you actually right now mean nothing to me. Not even enough for me to tell the truth to you. Man, if you lie to your wives, what does God say? Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Whenever you read the word abomination, you should think hate, hate, hate. Say it with me. Hey, hey, hey. If you really want to know what God hates, study abomination. You're of your father the devil and the lust of the father you'll do. He's a murderer from the beginning and abode not in truth. Because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And the serious part about lying, being deceitful, gossiping, exaggerating is... You are acting more like Satan than you are like Jesus. That's who you're following. Because Jesus is the way, the what? Truth. He never lied. Ever. Satan's been lying since the Garden of Eden. You know his biggest lie is? He, Adam, Eve. You know this God? He's really not who he says he is. And some of you have even found where you believe some of his lies, like God does not love you, and that God would not forgive you, and that God does not care. Those three things, all three are a lie. Okay? All I know is if you have a lying tongue, you have a very deceitful heart, because your tongue is a tattletale of your heart. A hurtful tongue, say it with me. Hurtful tongue. When I was a little kid, I learned a poem. And it's amazing. It's amazing that even as I start it, every one of you can quote it today. I'll start it. Sticks and stones. Keep going. Sticks and stones will break your bones. If I had a big old rock in my hand, I came and smacked him up. So, ooh, I hit you hard. <laughs> that would hurt. Yeah, that would hurt. Sticks and stones will break your bones, but this thing about words or names will never hurt me, that is a lie. Because words do hurt. They cut in, and they're not easily forgotten. When the Bible says, let no corrupt communication be set out of your mouth, that is a command of God, especially, men, you ready? To you guys as you talk to your kids and your wife. No corrupt communication. Never do you make fun of. Never do you cut down. Never do you treat as nothing. I don't care why, if you're upset or, man, can't you bounce this checkbook? Look at the lawn. You didn't even mow it right. And guys, we think because we have volume and size that we can intimidate. It's crazy. And God says none. Look what David said, who wet their tongue like a sword, even bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. Teens, are, teens can really be bad at this. Because they like, I don't know, they like to cut people down so they feel like they're bigger and they take their bow and arrow with words like, Phoom, you're stupid and Phoom, you're ugly and Phoom, you're worthless. Yeah. The words of a tail bearer are as wounds. They go down to the innermost parts of the belly. And when harsh things are said, when hurtful words are used, all of a sudden you smile and laugh like it's no big deal. But, oh, it's like being kicked in the stomach. Right, kids? When your parents get upset with you and yell at you, it hurts down here, doesn't it? Job said, how long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with your words? Words hurt. Are you careful what you say? Do you have a hurtful tongue? Years ago, at our church, I was a music pastor, and we worked with the youth some, and a little girl came. She was 14 years old. Her name was Karen. 
that Karen had special needs, okay? And she had a hard time learning some, and sometimes when she walked, she would kind of lose her equilibrium. And, and her parents, and Amber and I, my wife and I, we became good friends. And I still remember her mom coming to me one time, said, Rand, Rand, why? Why are teens so mean? I said, what do you mean? She said, okay, we, we have been from church to church to church. We've tried public school, private school. We do homeschool. Everywhere we go, when we first show up, the kids go to meet Karen, and hi, how are you? And they see she's a little different. And within a day or two, at least a week, we can stand back and watch. We see him make fun of her behind her. We see him laugh at her. She said, it hurts. Little Karen would notice some of it, but not much of it. There were four girls her age in the youth group at that time. And those girls chose to really, really love Karen and make her feel a part, okay? And one night, it was a Wednesday night after youth group, we were just, everything was over, and we were just standing around talking, goofing off, and all of a sudden, little Karen goes like this. She goes, ah! one, two, three, four, five. Five friends at the same time. She had never had that before. Two weeks later, on Wednesday night, she wasn't feeling good and asked her mom if they could go home. She went to bed. About an hour later, she called out for her mom. Little Karen had a massive heart attack, and she went to be with the Lord. You know what her mom told me at the funeral? She said, Rand, I am so thankful that at least for the last six months, Karen was loved. Now, I assume, I don't know you guys, but teens, kids, I assume if a Karen came to your church, I'm hoping you guys would reach out, right? You'd treat her nice and you'd make her feel special. If that is true, then why do you treat your brothers and sisters like dirt? Why do you fight all the time? Some of you parents, you'd put on a good show and smile and good to have you here and you go home and argue and say mean things to each other. How many of you men are married and you're married to a believer, a Christian? Let me see your hands. Put your hands down. Did you know every time you are harsh or mean or say something cutting to your wife, you know what you're doing? You are attacking God's daughter. Whoa. Now, we can be real fun and just teach all fun things. But we can dig down. Godly churches are made up of godly families. And godly families have people in them who try to be very, very careful with their tongues. What about an angry tongue? What does God say? A wrathful tongue stirs up strife. He that is slow to anger appeases strife. A fool's lips enter into contention. His mouth calls for strokes. We don't do it physically very much, but maybe even just verbally. Come on, come on, hit me, hit me, hit me. He that is soon or quick to be angry deals foolishly. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. But he that is hasty of spirit, exalted folly, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger rests at the bottom of fools. Do you notice something in those last three verses? Foolishly, folly, fools. God says it is so foolish. So foolish when you use angry words to try to hurt people. I grew up an incredibly angry kid. I did. I grew up with one of the most angry fathers that I've ever known. My mom left us, and then I was raised by my grandparents. And my granddad was a very, very heavy drinker. My grandma, she was cool. Okay, she's a Polish woman. She was about 4'11", both ways. And she was just <laughs> wonderful. She was wonderful. I grew up dodging things, being thrown, furniture smashed against walls. I grew up an angry kid. I'm not an angry man. God changed my heart. But I grew up angry. I never started a fight. But I kept getting in them for some reason. I shouldn't tell you this, but I got 75 demerits for beating up two guys at Bob Jones University. Okay, I'm a mess. Oh, I used to be more of a mess, okay? And I understand the grip that anger can have on your heart. 
And, and most people deal with their anger one of two ways. They explode, ventilate, or they clam up and hold it all in and then cry it out later when nobody is watching. Are you a powder or a shouter? Probably one of the two. All right, what if I started going to all the teens and all the kids? Tell me about your mom and dad. Tell me about your mom and dad. What would they say about you? And you have to understand, please, mom and dad, do you understand how angry words are riveted into an individual's memory? Yeah, growing up, I got beat. I don't feel any of that anymore. But I can still hear the cursing words. I still remember holding a pillow over my head so I didn't hear mom screaming while she, dad was beating her. And you think that it's no big deal. When I'm telling you, anger, angry parents make angry kids. I'm a camp guy. I counsel teens all the time, and sometimes they'll come to me and pour their hearts out. What am I supposed to do when a kid has an angry dad? And, and, and I'm supposed to tell him, you be close to him, you spend time with him, you obey them, you honor them, and then my Bible says, make no friendship with an angry man lest you learn his ways. That's tough to handle. Angry dads make angry kids. We must understand, even on the other side of that, that anger is still a choice. You kids, you teens, you say, yeah, my, my parents are angry. I mean, just this morning, just this morning, I get an email. Rand, help me. Uh, I'm trying to help this family. The mom and the dad both lose their temper and beat on their kids. They're abusive. What can I do? I mean, this is our world that we live. An angry tongue reveals an angry heart. Why are you so angry? Who have you refused to forgive? What sin have you not dealt with in God's way? So instead of blowing up or climbing up, fess up, okay? Did you know God will forgive you every time? He really will. I don't know your hearts. I wrote a book entitled, I'm sorry, I have nothing with me as far as a book table. But if you go to randhummel.com, then you go all the way to the bottom. There's a book called Turn Away Wrath, Meditations to Fight Anger and Bitterness. There's also one that says Fear Not, Meditations on Fear, Worry. There's one called Stress Less, Trust More. Most kids want to buy that for their moms and dads, okay? It's just the word of God. If you came to me even for counsel, I would say, okay, here's the book. I want you to read, finish this book in the next two weeks, then we'll meet together again. It's called Homework. If you're willing to do your homework and you go through the Word of God and all of a sudden, oh, that is so good, Lord, help me with that, it changes your life, okay? You don't have to stay angry forever. i got to keep going. Wicked tongue. Now, I hate to even have to mention this this morning. Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. You ready? Let it not be once named, verbalized, spoken among you. Stop it. Because godly saints, godly children, they don't talk like that. Neither filthiness, foolish talking, jesting, which means to twist and to turn, to turn and make something dirty that, just to get a laugh but rather giving a thanks. Colossians 3, put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. And you guys know, Exodus 27, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So I want us to learn something today. It's not cute to curse. It's not funny to be filthy. Say it with me. It's not cute to curse. It's not funny to be filthy. One more time. It's not cute to curse. It's not funny to be filthy. The wild, how many have been to the one of the wilds? Can I just see your hands if you've been to the wilds growing up? Okay, a number of you have. I get the privilege of being in New England, and we have a wonderful camp. Now, we only can go from like June till the end of October because we have to drain our pipes. Most of our buildings 
Uh, they they were built in in back when back when you were graduating high school, right around 1785. Okay, <laughs> he's he's my Brazilian friend here. Okay, so old, right? And so during the year, number one, I will say this, we get to do homeschool chapels. I forgot the little cards, but I'll get them to you. And Emily and I were talking about that. Live stream, every Wednesday, 11 to 11.30, Joe, the director, and I, we take turns preaching to the kids, and it's a blast. It really is. So if you have homeschoolers or homeschool grandkids, you need to have them go to the wilds of New England, check that out. But the wilds in North Carolina, they have this thing called a giant swing. It goes to the height of this building, probably about that high again. And we take like two of you. I take both of you, put you in hang gliding harnesses, and you kind of lean forward, and then it takes you all the way to the top. And when it clicks at the top, you fall about 25 feet free fall, as close to bungee jumping as most of us will ever get. And then you swing, become weightless on the other side, and go back and forth. How many say I would love to ride that? Let me see your hands. How many say you wouldn't get me on that thing, okay? I see you shaking your head. All right, really? It's not dangerous. They said, well, it's not that. It's like swinging back and forth. I kind of get sick to my stomach. That's the cool thing about this ride. We have measured it. You're going 41 miles per hour. The centrifugal force is so amazing. If you ever did throw up, you would swallow it. Nobody would ever know, okay? So you don't have to worry about that. But as you're running that, it's scary. It really is. I shouldn't say this, but every once in a while you get some ladies or some girls that are like, ah, ah. and so I'll push the button and take them up, and I get about this far from the top, and I take my thumb off the button. <clears throat> they jerk. They don't come down. And then I, at the bottom, I start hitting that thing like it's broke. <laughs> then I hit the slow button, and they slowly come back down. They said, what's the matter? I said, oh, I forgot to tell you. Have a good ride. And then I take them back up again. That's scary. But there's one part that I don't like about running that thing. Because I'm right here. I mean, their faces are right here in front of me. And we have this special cart. And now they're hanging. I said, OK, ready to go. And when I push the button, it kind of jerks you. And it's kind of scary. And most of the time, often, I hear three words. The first one is O. Oh, the second is my. And the third is what? God. I don't embarrass kids, and it's not just kids, adults too. But whenever they would do that, and again, I'm this close to them. Nobody else can hear. I say, hey, be careful. What? Be careful. You're taking my Lord's name in vain there. Do you know what they say every single time? Oh, I'm sorry, Rand. I wasn't thinking. Exactly. That's what it means to take God's name in vain. You're not thinking about God. You're not thinking about his holiness. You're not thinking about his power, his sovereignty. And to you, you can throw his name out because he means nothing to you. You say, man, that's not true. It may not be, but your tongue is a tattletale of your heart. And if you don't care and don't think about God and use his name like it's just nothing, the disrespect, that's why this is so important. Not to use his name in a vain, empty, think, thoughtless way, okay? And that's why it's not funny to be filthy. It's not cute to curse. You know what God wants us to have? A wise tongue. And as we close, what is a wise tongue? It's thankful, unlike the whining tongue. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Even when it's hard to say thank you, teens, if you've got parents that are like kind of tense and kind of like upset a lot, Lord, thank you for my mom and dad, change them, but thank you for my mom and dad. And parents, if you have kids that just constantly say no and rebel, Lord, thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to try to help them to realize that they will stand before God someday. What is a successful parent? A parent who has taught their kids that God is real and that every knee will bow. That's it. We don't save our kids. That's God's job. We can take care of the soil and do everything we can to get rid of the hardness and the weeds and the rocks and the thorns, but we can prepare the soil as the seed is given. The seed is the same, but it's God who saves. And it could be that you may have kids or grandkids that decide to reject God. Oh, breaks your heart but you can't save them you can't talk them into that but you can ready 
Dad, you can prepare your wife and your kids for judgment. You can prepare them for that. Okay. A wise tongue is truthful. It doesn't lie. It doesn't hate those that it's lying to. It speaks the truth in love. Isn't it cool how the word of God is just so cohesive? The wise tongue is kind, unlike the hurtful tongue. Instead of this corrupt communication, but that which is good to the use of building up, encouraging, edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Okay, look at me. We usually talk about the corrupt and we talk about edifying. What is this concept? Minister grace to the hearers. Minister means to serve. We need to constantly be serving each other. Grace, that's that unmerited favor. That's a kind word when we don't deserve it. Because moms, come on. Some of you girls can be pretty moody. Ah, you admit it. Some of you wear mood rings and sing the moody blues. Some of you are so moody, you have like an honorary doctorate from Moody Bible Institute. You're moody. <laughs> and your kids and your husband know, come down in the morning and, hey, you do. Ah. <laughs> okay, I got to be careful today. What do you do when it's early in the morning and mom's in one of her moods? You say, mom, I love you. I can tell you're having our day. I'm going to pray for you. You give them a big hug, and then you get out of there real quick. Okay. <laughs> Kindness. The wise tongue is forgiving, unlike the angry tongue, the bitterness, the wrath, the anger, the war cries, clamor, and the blasphemeo is the Greek word for evil speaking, is put away from you. You stop doing that. Instead, you're kind. What is kindness? Doing little things to show the worth of a person. Where's the teen guys? Raise your hand. Teen guys. All the teen guys, okay? See the number of your hands? I dare you to do something. I dare you this afternoon, go to your mom, say, hey, mom, um, next Friday night is okay if I go out on a date? What? Who? Oh, mom. She's the most beautiful, the most intelligent girl I have ever met in my life. It's you, Mom. I want to take you on a date. <laughs> teen girls, let me see your hands, okay? How about some of you teen girls going home saying to your dad, Daddy, next Saturday night, can I go out on a date? Who do you want to go with? Oh, Dad, I want to go out on a date with you. Nobody else, just me and you. I want to take you out if you'll loan me 50 bucks. But I want to take you out. I do. <laughs> Kindness is going to that little brother. That little sister gets in your closet, teens, without asking. That little brother that's all... Oh, Sometimes you drop the R, that little bother, and, and what do you do? You say, hey, Saturday morning is yours, 9 to 12. I don't care what you want to play, Candyland or oh, whatever, we'll play it. And then we're going to go to McDonald's, and we're going to just pig out, okay? Kindness. Tenderheartedness means welcome passion. It's the ability to see a hurting heart and the willingness to do something about it. And then we get to this word forgiving. Have we been lied to? Sure. Hurt? Definitely. Have you ever, like, displeased God? Have you ever been unthankful? Have you worried? Have you fretted? God forgives you for that. And he still loves you. We need to do the same to each other. The wise tongue is clean. It puts off the anger and wrath and malice and filthy communication. You know what we just did for the last 40 minutes? We meditated on a real special prayer that every single one of us in this room should pray every day. Lord, please, would you help me today? Could you help me, dear Lord, that every word that I say Every word that comes out of my mouth, everything I think, every meditation that goes through my heart. Lord, I want you to be pleased. I want it to be acceptable in your sight. You're my strength. You've saved me. You've redeemed me, Lord. I need your help. I can't do today without you. Guys, if we would pray something like that every single day, it change our lives and change our homes. Okay? All right. Let me pray for you. Let's pray. Father, your holy hush has stepped into our hearts many times this morning because we realize that our tongues really are a tattletale of our heart. And we're almost embarrassed of the things we say that we haven't even really thought about how, how much 
in thinking it's against you and against others. And because, I don't know, we love ourselves so much that we are kind of mean to others. And we get thoughtless of you. Thank you for reminding us that our tongue is a tattletale of the heart. And what we say is what we are. Forgive us. And I'm praying for all of us, but I'm praying for me. And I pray they, each individual would ask for your forgiveness. Give us the courage, maybe even this afternoon during a meal. Give us all the courage to ask forgiveness from our wives, husbands, kids, parents. Lord, we really, really, really want to please you. We, we don't want to live selfishly. So please help us that everything we say and everything we think would be acceptable in your sight. As we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Pastor.